Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for episode 5 of our technology safety series. My name is Cece Doucette and I am the Director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology and I'm also the in, uh, Education Services Director for a little nonprofit called Wireless Education. With that nonprofit, we have a schools and families course that anybody anywhere can go take for less than the cost of a movie ticket to quickly bring yourself up to speed on what the wireless risks are, what the medically recommended best practices for using today's technology are. And it can be used to train an entire school, an entire workforce, or a town. So please feel free to go to wirelesseducation.org or if you would like to look into the research on the wireless issue, please join us at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. That's M-A, the number four, safe tech, T-E-C-H, dot org. And uh, we have a, a lot of information about what's happening around in our towns. We have information on the science and additionally what's happening at the state level with public policy and inroads with other agencies. Um, in our last episode, we talked about town meeting warrant articles that show that citizens are at the point where we know enough. We know enough about the science. The FCC has been sued for ignoring 11,000 pages of scientific evidence of harm, and they have thus far, for almost two years now, ignored that court mandate. So citizens in Great Barrington, Sheffield, Upton and Chester, Massachusetts, have gotten local friends in the community to sign a petition to put a warrant article on for the May vote that says, we want to put a pause on any further wireless infrastructure build out until the FCC fulfills its court mandated order to account for the science and the vulnerabilities of children, of adults, of long-term exposures because when the FCC set their public radiation exposure limits back in the 90s, they only did modeling on a dummy with gel in its head for six minutes or 30 minutes, and that has nothing to do with the ubiquitous exposures that we are all exposed to today. So we're very grateful that citizens are helping their towns to learn, and it's not an us against them confrontation, it's like, hey, who knew, right? We're all in this together. So I have such respect for citizens who come from the heart with the facts, approach their towns, and begin this critically important conversation. I'm also very grateful to WCCA Television here in Worcester, Massachusetts, for inviting us into the studio so that we can help share with you what doesn't get covered in mainstream media. Um, as we know, most of mainstream media today is owned by these big corporations that also own the wireless industry and other big environmental polluters. Uh, so we don't get it through mainstream media and we're so very grateful to our cable stations because oftentimes they are the last bastion of independent reporting. So with us today, we're very honored to have Carolyn Streeter and David Gold from the town of Rutland, Massachusetts. And, you know, none of us ever imagined we'd need to make time in our already busy lives to address technology safety. So when we have dedicated citizens who learn the risks and won't stop until we get it right, we're just so grateful to have you join us in the studio today. So, Carolyn, why don't you go ahead and say a few words about how you figured out wireless risks, and um, then we'll ask David to do the same, and then we'll jump into what's happening in Rutland today. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for having us. Um, so I learned about wireless risks primarily about a year and a half ago when... Um, well, I should back up a little bit. Back in the day, years ago, I, I had heard that there's some harm to health by, from cell phones. Um, and I completely forgot about that information. It was just um, way in the back of my mind somewhere. But then what happened a year and a half ago was I learned that um, where I live in Rutland and where I, I've been there in this house for 14 years, um, my neighbor is was 
had proposed to the town to put a cell tower on his property. Um, and that tower has since been approved by the town to be built. So that cell tower, um, I realized a year and a half ago, would be 900 feet from my house, my house itself, um, and closer than that to some of my neighbor's homes and much closer than that to the middle school building in town and about the same distance to the elementary school building. Um, so that's when I started looking around online because um, again there was something in the back of my head that told me I should be pretty concerned about this and so I think that the websites I first landed upon and spent a lot of time on to learn about this was your website Massachusetts for Safe Technology but also Environmental Health Trust ehtrust.org. Um, so that, yeah, a year and a half ago is when I started really learning about this stuff. Wow, I didn't realize it was that recent. Um, David, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm David Gold, and um, I retired to uh, Rutland uh, after being in Boston to live with my partner. Um, I enjoy music and gardening, and um, was enjoying the beauty of central Massachusetts and um, got word uh, a year and a half ago that there, our neighbor from three doors down was proposing a 140-foot cell tower on his property. And I went and talked to him. I said, because cell towers to me are a monstrosity visually, and my concern was originally just the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, where's this going to be? And he pointed off in the north west direction. I said, so I'm going to see this cell tower every time I'm gardening uh, on my side yard. And he's like, no, no, you won't see it. Well, you, you'll see it in the winter and the fall. So I said, well, that's, you know, that's an outrage, you know. And um, in fact, the, uh, our location is in the town center of Rutland, which is, has a lot of history and um, it just struck me as totally wrong to put something so industrial in uh, right in the center of a somewhat bucolic, uh, somewhat rural town. And um, so I started uh, vi um, visiting my neighbors and um, doing some leafleting, and that's where I met Carolyn, a couple blocks away, and. Carolyn's background is more scientific than mine, and she's um, very involved in the uh, environment. And she clued me in on a lot of other things about um, cell towers besides the aesthetics of it. Mm -hmm. And then just going online and reading uh, the reports that are coming from the... Um, mm, off the radar, not really off the radar, but just unpublicized scientific um, concerns. I was like, this is really serious. And it was the fact that the closest, it was in such close proximity to an elementary school and a middle school in Rutland made me realize that this affects the whole town, right. not just this small community, this enclave where we are, but that children are going to be spending the better part of their day um, with this thing pulsating uh, right. constantly. And we have just had a forum here. Uh, it started with Courtney Gillardi out in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where Verizon put a cell tower right on top of this neighborhood. And children, adults, pets got so sick that they had to abandon their homes. And they've been fighting in Pittsfield for three years now. And for the first time in the United States, their city council ordered their Board of Health to do the investigation. And so their Board of Health did. And they were very fortunate to have this um, nurse, Bobby Orsi, who had been in the town. And she had fought General Electric and their environmental pollutants, PCBs, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So she understands the corporate playbook and how hardball these guys play. So. Uh, Bobby Orsi and her team on the Board of Health investigated. They spoke to the doctors who gave diagnoses of microwave sicknesses or electromagnetic illnesses. They spoke to the scientists 
who have published the literature that radio frequency is very harmful. Mm -hmm. And they also spoke to engineers, they spoke to the industry people, and the industry brings in a gentleman by the name of Eric Swanson from Pittsburgh. And he said, Dr. Eric Swanson, but they actually investigated him and when they looked into his background, they found that he has never published one paper on electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. His specialty is quarks and other areas of physics. So they bring in this guy with a PhD after his name and everyone thinks, oh, he must know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But he's just paid by the industry to say what they want him to say. So when Pittsfield completed their investigation after 15 months, they documented all of the harm. They said these families had no choice but to abandon their homes and we need to get them back home. And so what they did is they issued an emergency order to Verizon that said, you have seven days, please come to the table and let's just figure this out. Another uh, gentleman in Pittsfield who owns commercial properties has said, I'll be happy to have you put the cell tower on my property. It won't impact any neighborhoods. Yeah. So there are options ready to pursue. Yeah. And instead of coming to the table, Verizon went to the court at the 11th hour and put an injunction against that emergency order saying that, oh, you know, you don't, you don't have any say in this. The FCC says we get to put it where we want to put it. And so the Board of Health is very smart. They had already consulted with attorneys at the state level and came to understand that what the FCC says is when you are putting an application in for a cell tower, um, you need to make sure that you can at least get a phone call connection within reason. That's what the FCC says. It doesn't say that you have to build out all this new capacity for the industry to spin up their next revenue stream, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like smart city superhighways and fast downloads and stuff. Those are added services that the industry is pushing on us and into our communities. And of course, they need more infrastructure to make more money off of this, right? right. Um, so what the Board of Health discovered is that the FCC you know, whatever they've got, that only applies to the application process. Once something goes into the community, if it's a nuisance or causing harm to the people or in the environment, the Board of Health has jurisdiction. Hmm. And so <clears throat> what happened in Pittsfield is that <clears throat> that injunction went in and their city council and their mayor would not give their Board of Health the funding. And it wasn't an astronomical amount. There were a couple different ways they could do it. Either way, the total would have only been about $84,000. So their town wouldn't back them to take this to court to get these families back in their house. They've been living mm. in their cars. They've been living in tents. They've been couch surfing with people. They've had to move into properties that weren't fit to live in because they're still paying on their original homes. Mm -hmm. So there are exciting things happening in the courts. And you know, we, we don't want this going to court. We just want our towns to know enough to do the right thing up front and get their zoning code properly situated because as attorney Scott McCullough tells us, the industry comes in and tells our towns, your hands are tied. And Scott comes back and he's the attorney who gave the oral arguments in the lawsuit against the FCC with the Environmental Health Trust and Children's Health Defense. And he said, your hands are not tied. You may have one finger tied, but Congress left you many other ways. You got nine other fingers, but our towns don't know. So there is an organization called Americans for Responsible Technology. They just hosted an amazing forum with top attorneys from around the country, some of whom used to work for the telecom industry, so they know the playbook, and then they figured out the harm and they switched teams. So if you go out to Americans for Responsible Technology, you can bring that programming to your town and listen directly to these attorneys who will tell you to do it right. And then Americans for Responsible Technology has a toolkit where they've culled all the best practices and they have a checklist for our towns and they have a sample zoning code that you could at least sit down with your town attorney and your town administrators and say, okay, what do we have on the books today? 
what are the gaps, and here's a checklist. Let's just update our zoning code and get it right so we can protect ourselves. So right. tell us about the conversations that you've been having with your town in Rutland and how that has gone. Um, well, I would like to mention that that emergency order that the Pittsfield Board of Health issued to Verizon, that's a wealth of information and um, it's nice because it's so concise. Yes. So that's a good place for people to go to who are interested in this issue to learn. Yep. To and that's at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. If you go to the state efforts page and scroll down, you will find it under the Department of Public Health or Health and Human Services. So, okay, yeah. all right. And that was something I emailed um, to, you know, Dave and I over the course of nine or 10 months. Um, the zoning board in Rutland was holding public hearings. And so we did a lot of, a lot of things over the course of that nine or 10 months um, to try to educate the zoning board about this whole issue and to try to educate our neighbors and residents in town about what was happening here. Um, but I did email that, that was, that emergency order was one of the things I emailed to, I believe I sent it to the Board of Health, to the select persons and the zoning board. Excellent. Um, and then um, as a follow on to that, the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards understands that wireless is not safe. And they have a legal guideline for all the boards of health in Massachusetts. And they added a while back four pages on cell towers. I believe they're in the process of updating that to bring it current with what current policy and the lawsuit with the FCC is. Um, so that's an excellent resource. And they sent in an amicus brief to the court, which is just a friend of the court document that says, we support the citizens of Pittsfield because we know the harm that's being done. Right. So we're breaking ground in Pittsfield in a lot of ways. First, with them not backing down, mm -hmm. fighting this for three years now, getting their board of health to do an investigation, and now it's in the courts and they are suing the town of Pittsfield because the town of Pittsfield would not do with their board of health was commanded to do. Yeah. So right. So right. I feel for you guys because you're in the same position. Right. Um, we understand that once a cell tower goes up, it's really hard to take down. But it right. has happened. Oh really? It has. In Ripon, California, they put up a cell tower by Sprint. Yeah. At an elementary school, four children developed cancer. Yeah. Mm really unusual cancers. So to have these unusual gliomas and you know brain cancers and spinal cancers, and then teachers were getting breast cancers from yeah. working at that school. And then when they started really figuring it out and they went and talked to the neighborhood, more than 100 people in that neighborhood had gotten cancer in the time that that cell tower was radiating. Yeah. So because there was enough community pressure and the media got involved, ultimately Sprint wound up moving that cell tower away. So it can happen. And um, Mason's mom, Mason is one of the children that got sick in Ripon, California. Mason's mom, I think her name is Monica, she joined that legal forum that's now out at Americans for Responsible Technology and you can hear their story and it's just heartbreaking. And she said once that tower was removed, no new cases of cancer yeah. had been brought to their attention. That was a remarkable story. She spoke at the expert forum for on cell towers. Yes. I think the title was Let's Connect on Cell Towers and that yes. was held just two or three weeks ago. Yeah. And that was an excellent forum. Is that link that's probably linked Yeah, on that's your... at Americans for Responsible Technology. Um, I have a YouTube page myself under CC or Cecilia Doucet and I just shared those on my page as well. So yeah. they're widely available but people simply don't know because mainstream media won't cover this in many regions. Right. Right. So you brought this to your town's attention. Right. And then what happened? So the first public hearing was in November of 2021. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's that was a Zoning Board of Appeals public hearing. Um, so prior to the hearing, Dave and I ran around the center of town and put up lawn signs hearing Great idea. Um, cell tower proposed next to the schools next to the neighborhoods and so people showed up to that first public hearing residents showed up 
Um, the room was almost too small to fit everybody, and about 20 residents spoke or so. Um, nobody spoke in favor of the cell tower. I like to say over and over again that nobody spoke in favor of the cell tower over these nine to ten months worth of hearings, or about, I think, also nine to ten hearings within that time frame. Um, a relative towards the very end of, of um, that, those hearings, a relative of the property owner where the cell tower is to be erected, he spoke. And that was the only person in this entire time that spoke in favor of this cell tower going up. Um, so, and we got 446 uh, signatures on a petition wow. from residents saying, we don't want this tower in this location. Um, so we got about 20 something people to that first hearing. And it was interesting because several people said to me, I had no idea this was happening. And the lawn signs were what got pe a lot of people there. Um, so we did, we just did so much over that nine to 10 months. We went to every single hearing and we did a lot of outreach. Um, you know, lawn, there were many more rounds of lawn yeah. signs that went up, trying to keep people coming to the hearings, which mm -hmm. is a hard thing to do over that a stretch of time like that. Yeah. Um, we proposed to the town that they put the cell tower or consider putting the cell tower on town land mm -hmm. on a much larger piece of town land that was over 100 acres. It was at a higher elevation. We thought potentially the cell tower would function better. Um, it was there were far less homes around the homes that were there could be the tower could be located further away from them there were no schools around um we really tried to get the town to come around to considering this alternative site i provided them with information for how the town of auburn um, successfully located a tower on a similar town site um anyways that went, ended up going nowhere um, the zoning board said it wasn't their job to consider an, finding an alternative site for this tower. We tried to educate the board too on the fact that um, the burden is on the applicant, meaning the developer of the tower um, and or the carrier, in this case AT&T, to prove to us that this is the least intrusive site they could find for this tower and to prove to the town that they suffered a significant gap in coverage. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't feel that either of those things were ever, ever successfully proved to us. Yeah, um, proven. Yeah, so. because a lot of times the industry folks will come in and say, oh, we have a gap in coverage, and the town will go, well, okay, we'll help you fix that. But they don't provide dropped call logs no. to prove a gap in coverage. And again, as you noted, the only thing they have to account for is can you make a phone call? Not all these added services. Can you make a phone call within reason? Yeah. And um, the drive-by, they should do a drive-by and show whether people can or cannot get a signal at the location where this is proposed. So, mm -hmm. you know, our towns are made up of oftentimes good doobies, a lot of times ego gets in the way, yeah. a lot of times the industry disinformation has been incredibly you know, persuasive, but when they don't listen to the facts, then what do you do? Right. <laughs> so we just tried to keep at it. Mm -hmm. um, I just so. wanted to add that um, besides the education and the fact-finding and um, getting to the truth uh, or the hidden truths, um, what the two um, actions that really affected the ZBA, the Zoning Board, and all, what I thought almost turned the tide was first that first meeting when people came from all corners with all different agendas and all different concerns, health, um, uh, um, use of roadways, mm -hmm. everything, and piled on, and everyone's two minutes to speak, next one, boom, boom, and you could see the ZBA was getting overwhelmed, getting very, you know, taking us very seriously. Good. Then time passes, um, canceled meetings, and so on. Pandemic. Um, then uh, the applicants did a whole 
dog and pony show um, with their experts. We didn't. We had to just sit there twiddling our thumbs. At any rate, um, the other um, time that I thought we had had the uh, the battle won was when we presented the board with 400 and over about 450 signatures from the town, and there were a couple of board members that were like, "Well, I wasn't." I, I wasn't aware of this, and my job is to represent the people of the town. Mm -hmm. In this short period of time, you have all these signatures. He said, that's going to weigh a lot on me. And I, I thought, if they took a vote now, and they almost did, because um, uh, the head of the ZBA was, was polling them, I thought that we would have the right, you know, requisite number of people on our side. But the... Um, it got pulled back from that official vote, and they sort of regrouped and suddenly became a unanimous um, approval at the following meeting. So was this a special permit that was being approved, or was this just a run-of-the-mill application? Special permit and variance. Okay. And that's where we're at now, is that we have an attorney, Paul Revere, mm -hmm. a dedicated cell tower uh, attorney from Massachusetts. Yeah who is in our corner, and he is a, a nephew of Paul Revere, ah, the original. Okay. And he's going to ride in, and he is going to... Um, uh, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> the um, midnight ride Argue our again. case and win, and this is the so day... So you guys have filed a case against the town of Rutland? Yeah, yep. arguing the issuance of the special permit. Okay, that you think it was not legally issued. Exactly. Correct. All right. Yeah. So, so um, it looks like you guys have a court date coming up. Yeah, it's um, Thursday, May 18th, about a month from now. And Attorney Revere has suggested that as many people, and they don't have to be from Rutland, who can show up and bear witness at that meeting. And uh, we might have a uh, little demonstration out in front of the courthouse before the meeting. There's nothing wrong with it voicing our opinions in, right. but just to fill the courtroom can have an effect on the outcome of this um, action that we're taking. So we're urging, I'm trying to blow <laughs> this, we're urging all of you out there, um, if you hear uh, and believe in this, in this concern, and again, the fact that Schools are affected, mm -hmm. school children are affected, I think it's so right. important. Right, so, you know, we need to take action on these opportunities because if we don't, if we're too busy, if life gets too crazy and we just let it go by, once those cell towers go up, it is brutal to try and get them taken down. So please, and how fortunate that we're here in Worcester's Cable Station, and maybe a lot of you in the community, even if you don't know a ton about this issue, Come and be part of this hearing if you can come out at 2 o'clock on May 18th right here to the Worcester Superior Courthouse. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And you can reach out through Massachusetts for safe technology, and we'd be happy to connect you with Carolyn and David. So have a tech-safe day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.